Um, I have in support two other prolific speakers who would be uh, covering the other aspects. Uh, so please give me a shout if you can see my slides. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is my topic, thinking major organs in complications of dysglycemia, and I'll be talking about liver in perspective. And uh, this is 2019 Diacon, good old days when we could actually see each other in person, interact each other, catch up over a cup, cup of coffee, which never happens now. So uh, we know that uh, it's entire spectrum, starting from, say, the central obesity, metabolic syndrome, dysglycemia, they're all related and there's a lot of crosstalk even between the liver and the heart, which my uh, colleague is going to talk about. But central to all of that is probably insulin resistance and we'll come to that. So if you look to diabetes, obesity and uh, obviously dysfunctional adipose tissue or inflammation in the adipose tissue leads on to increased free fatty acids, increased lipolysis, and increased insulin resistance that leads on to NFLD. If that progresses, the inflammation continues and there's decrease in the levels of adiponectin that leads on to NASH, uh, uh, followed by increased fibrosis, increase in the reactive oxygen species, and then maybe uh, an insult like uh, HCV in, uh, infection that leads on to cirrhosis. And finally, uh, there are genetic and epigenetic factors that might convert that into hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, this is the spectrum, and we are all aware initially when there is normal glycemia or even impaired glucose tolerance, uh, the levels of insulin secretion goes up. Um, but if eventually there is a lot of insulin resistance. In spite of that, the beta cells are put onto overdrive and uh, Eventually, there is a decline in the uh, beta cell function, and in spite of that, and, and eventually the levels of insulin starts coming down. So insulin resistance, again, is the key feature here. Uh, here, again, we are talking about the adipose tissue insulin resistance, and you see increased lipolysis and increased free fatty acids, along with decreased anti-inflammatory adipokine secretion, along with increased secretion of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that you see in here, all of them add um, on to increased insulin resistance in the liver and muscles, and there is activation of pro-inflammatory pathways and impaired insulin secretion. So again, uh, again and again, I keep uh, re-emphasizing, and DeFronzo is always a believer that insulin resistance is a key that leads on to all other um, uh, uh, all other pathophysiologies. So you see that insulin resistance here causes NFLD hyperlipidemia, lipotoxicity, and again, a lot of oxidative, uh, oxidative stress, and that leads on to beta cell destruction. <laughs> Similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have hypoglycemia, uh, type 2 diabetes, there is glucotoxicity, again, a lot of oxidative stress and leading on to beta cell dysfunction. So uh, what happens is there is excess of free fatty acids, um, the in, uh, neoglucogenesis that happens during dysglycemia, increase in the VLDL that is produced by the liver. And this is uh, what, what we see in here is the dietary fat that leads on to free fatty acids, triglycerides, decrease in the adiponectin, et cetera. And um, overall, you have uh, adipose tissue lipolysis, again, increasing insulin resistance. Again, if you have dysglycemia and beta cell dysfunction, that adds on to the oxidative stress. And so uh, glucotoxicity, uh, these all are, are insults for the liver. And finally, you have the entire spectrum starting from uh, NFLD, NASH, cirrhosis, going on to have cell carcinoma. So NFLD, the risk factors are nutritional abnormalities like obesity, metabolic disorders like diabetes. And along with that, you have the entire range of metabolic disorders. Occupational exposure, for example, environmental toxins, uh, surgery, and drugs. And insulin resistance, again, uh, intracellular signaling pathways. You see, as we were talking about, there is gluconeogenesis and also decrease in the glycogen synthesis is there. And NFLD can cause accumulation of liver fat. And also potential in indicators of elevated liver fat, increased BMI, waist circumference, increased ALT, triglycerides, and all the biochemical parameters that you see in here, increase uh, or increase in the HOMA IR. So clinicians should always be alerted in the presence of increase in the liver fat, 
along with that, if they have obesity, they have biochemical changes that are listed there. And also if there is uh, increase in the uh, fasting glucose or uh, uh, pineal glucose, glucose, uh, impaired glucose tolerance for that matter. So um, the peculiar features in Asians is that we carry a lot more fat around the waist as compared to our Western counterparts. And because of that, we have higher insulin resistance. And this was exemplified in this particular uh, diagram where Chitranjan Yagnik, one of our uh, leading scientists from India. And along with that, you have his fellow uh, who is a Western counterpart. And you, you see, in spite of very similar BMI, the fat distribution is very, very different. And uh, the central obesity is more in the Indian phenotype. So very typical features, uh, uh, early onset of diabetes in Indians as compared to the Caucasians. Central obesity is more, more insulin resistance and they're hyperinsulinemic. And also and we have a lot less physical activity um, as compared to our Western counterparts, although I must say that we are becoming more aware now. Uh, and also there is a, a genetic predisposition. So coming to the NFLD, it's probably the most common liver disease in countries affecting almost 10 to 24 percent. And if you look at the Indian perspective, 16 to 32 percent of the general population in India has NFLD. Uh, among them, almost 31% are diagnosed with NASH. 70% of the type 2 diabetes have NFLD, and one-third of the NFLD population is estimated to have NASH. So it's almost 14 million. And we know that a lot, uh, so 77 million is the population of diabetic in India, but more than 90 million is also suffering from pre-diabetes who have absolutely no idea that they have dysglycemia because they're completely asymptomatic and they don't seek help, but... Uh, the damage is already being done. So this is the morphology that you have in here. You look at the steatosis and fibrosis in this diagram. Uh, so it's an entire spectrum, starting from steatosis, uh, progressing to steatohepatitis and NASH, moving on to cirrhosis, and finally, the final stages would be uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So hepatic lipid accumulation is not the sole factor uh, for the hepatocellular injury. There is more to it. So the first hit is probably, uh, you know, like uh, as we were talking, insulin resistance, etc. And if there is oxidative stress that progresses, uh, then there is a second hit that moves on to NASH and continuous oxidative stress and activation of the HPCs um, would lead on to the fibrosis and cirrhosis as we were talking earlier. So oxidative stress is a key role in uh, disease progression in NFLD. And this is the entire spectrum that you see in here, starting from NFLD to NASH, NFLD-related cirrhosis, and also NASH with fibrosis. Final stage is hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, the risk factors for progression would be uh, dysglycemia, weight gain, hypertension, menopause, genetic polymorphisms. Uh, again, increased hepatic insulin resistance, inflammatory cytokines, diabetogenic hepatokines and reactive oxygen species. All of these are uh, results uh, which, which can lead on from, uh, say, NFLD all the way to uh, uh, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and finally, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So metabolic syndrome, again, uh, the key point here is the insulin resistance that can lead on to dyslipidemia, that can lead on to hypertension, atherosclerosis, uh, dysglycemia, or type 2 diabetes. Uh, so we need to address that. Visceral obesity is uh, very important. It increases in liver-free fatty acids uh, and increases the VLDL. Glucose utilization in the peripheral tissues is decreased. Uh, there is hyperinsulinemia. Uh, and of course, we know that there is decrease in the HDL and increase in the uh, LDL, along with that, there is quite a significant rise in the triglycerides as well. So liver is the major target of injury in the patients with uh, uh, metabolic syndrome. Insulin resistance can be as high as 30% in the adults. Fat accumulation in the hepatocytes um, because of gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, as we were talking about, and uh, non-alcoholic fatty acids, uh, fatty liver disease is up to 20% of the adults. So liver is the pivotal uh, has a pivotal role in this metabolic homeostasis of glucose and lipids. Obesity, uh, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes cause dysregulations in the uptake and synthesis of fatty acids by the liver and their oxidation and export consequently result in dyslipidemia and hepatic steatosis. 
what can be the symptoms? They could be completely asymptomatic or uh, so steatosis and mash few or no symptoms at all. Sometimes alcoholic hepatitis, which develops, can have fatigue, weight loss, and weakness. And when they have a full-blown cirrhosis, they can have fluid retention, muscle wasting, bleeding, liver, um, uh, lip cirrhosis, etc. So uh, diagnosis and evaluation of the NFLD. Of course, we know that the biochemical parameters are very important. So we look at the liver enzymes. Uh, and also, uh, if you're uh, actually going by the alcohol, you need to rule out alcoholic fatty liver, which can closely resemble NFLD and could be a good uh, uh, pro uh, uh, close differential diagnosis. And if you look at the histological features of NASH, as we said, there are different stages starting from steatosis, steatohepatitis, fibrosis, and cirrhosis. I wouldn't go into the details. And this is the algorithm that we follow. We look at the liver enzymes. If there is persistent elevation, then we look whether there is obesity. If the answer is yes, then treat the associated condition, try to uh, bring down the body weight, uh, do uh, lifestyle modifications, uh, uh, diet management, etc. And in spite of that, if the liver enzymes are ele elevated, uh, then it, uh, or uh, if they are not elevated, then you repeat the liver enzymes in about six months' time. Now, if the answer is that there is no obesity in spite of that, there's persistent elevation, then you need to do a liver biopsy. Uh, look for NASH. If the answer is yes, then uh, it's, is it persistently progressive? Then you have to consider a protocol treatment. So how do you treat NFLD? Uh, so if you have the first hit, as we were saying, the insulin resistance, then you have insulin sensitizers and anti-hyperlipidemics uh, that you can try out. If you have the second hit, that's after steatosis, moving on to NASH, you can consider the antioxidants and the cytoprotectants. And then from the NASH towards fibrosis and cirrhosis, that's the third hit. And in that scenario, you can use, uh, say, for example, uh, so we, we don't have anything very robust at this point of time when you have established cirrhosis. There's very little we can do, but there's a lot, in, uh, a lot, lot of ongoing research that is going on. But obviously, we have to emphasize the role of weight loss and diet and exercise. And also, we have to remember there's a lot of free fatty acid levels that go uh, higher as you move towards the NASH. And uh, one, of the, one of the agents that look into this uh, particular agent is the saroglitazar, and you have the evidences trial. Evidences one is completed, the other ones are ongoing at the moment. And probably we have to have an algorithm uh, where we need to fit in uh, that anybody with coexisting NFLD we should be considering with the emerging evidences, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, GLP1 receptor analog, or thiazeline times. To summarize, Z, uh, insulin resistance and, of course, metabolic syndromes are widely prevalent. High prevalence of NFLD, even in non obese as we know. So there, are, uh, uh, there's a need for reliable non-invasive uh, investigation. Um, so, so there are a lot many that are coming up. Some of them are still not available in India. As we said, sarvoclitazar is now approved in India for national NFLD uh, in uh, patients with diabetes and otherwise. And of course, those who are diabetic, uh, then you should not forget pyoglitazone because we do have robust data uh, supporting its use with the newer evidences that are being generated, GLP-1 receptor analogs and SGLT2 inhibitors uh, should be considered. So to summarize uh, the relation between a dysglycemia and NFLD, again, diabetes promotes, increases the risk of steato hepatitis increases risk of cirrhosis and increases risk of epithelial carcinoma. Similarly, uh, if there is an FLD that uh, worsens the insulin resistance, it increases the risk of etherogenic dyslipidemia, increases risk of type diabetes, and it's uh, increasingly difficult to manage. And also there is a crosstalk between the liver and uh, the heart, which my colleague is going to talk about. Thank you so much. And uh, back to the chair, Chris. So... <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Supratik. That was well in time and very well put. Uh, I think you have covered everything. And uh, off late, we are being, I mean, there is a lot of attention to the liver as far as diabetes and its complications are concerned. So I think now we can move on to the next speaker and Dr. Ripun will take over. Dr. Ripun? Hello? Dr. Ripun, are you there? Yeah, okay. I'm here. I'm yeah. here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next speaker... They, in fact, uh, what I feel the subject of the, today's discussion is something different. That is interlinking the target organs in the causation of the 
complication. That should be the aim. And I would like to request uh, Dr. Suresh Damudara. He is uh, very well known to all of us. He's an MBBS MRCP from London. And he has done the basic and postgraduate specialty and super specialty training in England. He was awarded the, the Donald D. Wetcher International Scholar Award, a lot of publications to his credit. And he was also awarded by the International Symposium on Diabetes with India Academy of Diabetes Award, outstanding contribution to Diabetes Education Award in, uh, back in 2019. He has presented and published many abstracts and papers in international meetings and journals. His research is mainly advanced glycated product and arterial stiffness in the type 2 diabetes. Over to you, Dr. Suresh. Um. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. Now, thank you for the wonderful opportunity. I think uh, uh, next uh, eight or nine minutes, if I can uh, focus on linking the major organs, the complication of dysglycemia. Uh, i am just deal with the only heart uh, today because liver, my colleague has covered and kidney will be covered soon. Now, this is a topic uh, it's being discussed in this EASD as well. But uh, I think we know uh, diabetes itself is a cardiovascular risk and it's a major cause of death in uh, diabetes mellitus, even in type 1s. Uh, but diabetes with hypertension, the risk is almost fivefold. And we know this paper uh, that has been there and from 1998 uh, that the type 2 on coronary almost seven years instance uh, of fatal or non-fatal MI. So with diabetes, the risk is extremely high. We know this bit. Now, uh, vascular outcomes, we had a discussion before this uh, lecture uh, about the, how the vascular outcome affects. Uh, here, uh, we are well known that the coronary and coronary disease and non-fatal MI and stroke and other things are more high in patients with the diabetes when compared to non-diabetic population. Um, so, uh, diabetes is associated with significant loss of uh, life in years. Almost on average, a 50-year-old diabetic with diabetes with no history of vascular disease is almost six years younger at the time of death than the counterpart with diabetes. So we know the risk factors, greater risk of cardiovascular disease. This is like a pre-diabetic state. So if you look at the meta-analysis of almost 18 clinical trials, it is no doubt that there is high risk of cardiovascular disease in even pre-diabetics. So pre-diabetic itself um, is a greater risk of cardiovascular disease and CV mortality benefit is seen if uh, pre-diabetes is done, done. So when you correct the pre-diabetes and if you are almost in the border of diabetes, if you try to uh, do the lifestyle as we had a discussion before, uh, if you do that and then uh, the cardiovascular mortality benefit is almost there. How it happens, uh, we know there is a genetic susceptibility that we had a discussion again. And then the uh, uh, epigenetics that has been discussed as well, nutrition, obesity, and physical inactivity, and insulin resistance, my colleague was discussing for liver, uh, hyperinsulinemia, which lead to IgT and hyperglycemia. And then with all the other challenges like diabetes onset, complication, disability, and death, uh, the mechanisms behind this atherosclerosis, hyperglycemia, and hypertension, you got the microvascular and macrovascular disease. Now, the ticking clock hypothesis is another one just showing that pre-diabetes and the diabetes will lead to micro and macrovascular complication, no question about it, and the diabetic dyslipidemia and hypertension, along with uh, poor control, uh, contributes to augment, uh, if you like, uh, the diabetes leading into macrovascular disease. And if I want you to remember one slide out of the cardiovascular talk, this will be it. The mechanism, how it happens is uh, the disease progression. we got a subclinical atherosclerosis. That's what is being discussed now as uh, asymptomatic CVDs with all the SGLT2s of showing benefit. And atherosclerotic, obviously, once the disease is fully established, advanced glycated end products and inflammation with interleukin-6 and other things. And then the infections are being talked about, insulin resistance is the one that I will come to uh, very briefly uh, before the end of my talk. So thrombosis, uh, PAI and TF and uh, uh, decrease in TPA is also 
contributed to the mechanism so hyperglycemia and then endothelial dysfunction if you look at it uh, breakfast lunch and dinner we have a very gly high glycemic excursion uh, with a carbohydrate load uh, then what happens is the oxidative stress endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory reaction all will be there and what is the evidence that showing that i showed you the evidence of pre diabetics getting benefit or getting into cardiovascular disease but what is the evidence to show when you treat the diabetes uh, uh, then there is a decrease in microvascular and macrovascular mortality is there with accord advance and vadt uk pds is one thing that showed uh, with a long term follow up there is a huge benefit and it is like a metabolic memory now impact of glycemia and cv risk uh, again uk pds to show micro and macrovascular disease is reduced when you reduce the hba1c now you you can ask whether the intensive glycemic control always works uh, answer is probably not um very intensive work like uh, accord on vadt didn't show much benefit if there is uh, early control is not there and if you do an intensive control later in fact the mortality is more in a cot trial now uh, this is almost like a 10000 patients uh, uh, glucose intensive glucose lowering and what we got is that uh, the study concluded the comparison of standard therapy the use of intensive therapy targeting hba1c below 6 uh, had a five year non fatal myocardial infarction but increased the five year mortality so not necessarily all the tight sugars are good Uh, and we know about uh, uh, a drugs causing benefit and that has been proved only with sglt2 uh, with amperage uh, trial and after that now glp once has got some evidence uh, with ampa showed that uh, uh, compared to placebo there is a lower rate of primary cardiovascular outcome and this has been talked about and then ampa uh, further trials have been out uh, very recently now the declatemi is almost like a primary prevention trial uh, but um, it, it showed um, decrease in cardi uh, cardiac failure admissions but um, that who had more risk of uh, cardiovascular disease treatment with dapa did not result in higher or lower rate of mace than placebo but did not uh, lower the rate of cardiovascular death for heart failure and that is the important point actually so you got the reduction of relative risk reduction of 17% during hospitalization of heart failure as glt2 uh, proved beyond doubt they are very very useful drugs in terms of uh, heart failure reduction irrelevant of the molecule and it should start to be the class effect now ada uh, and asd recommendation you can see the comorbidities as cvd ckd and heart failure all should be thought about when you consider uh, the drug management again just the choice of therapy reflects cardiac cerebrovascular and renal status and that is from aac as well so i given you the signs and then the guidelines now uh, but how about esi and rssdi guidelines again uh, patient with pre diabetes should be screened for risk factors and intensive glycemic should be targeted but uh, consider the new drugs to minimize the uh, cv risk this is the guidelines from esi and rssdi and all the therapeutic drugs will be there uh, uh, showing the benefits in terms of uh, reducing the uh, a1c therefore reducing the cardiovascular protection uh, but as i said uh, this was discussed this topic was discussed in the csd uh, happening or happened just uh, concluded uh, one or two uh, just uh, this week actually is happening so evidence of uh, cardiac insulin resistance was spoken about uh, ischemic myocardium areas are uh, have low uptake of glucose compared to high uh, the proper areas and then uh, there should, there is thought to be improving myocardial efficiency also metabolism for example insulin sensitivity uh, glitazone was discussed and uh, the other studies that is discussed in this uh, cardiac side of thing was derick study Uh, about dapa on improving the insulin sensitivity and the liver and body fat and the study found to be that improving the weight and glycemic control liver fat and uh, uh, the the cutaneous fats now dapa cardiac study is also discussed uh, on myocardial function and uh, metabolism uh, almost with ef of more than 50 but there is no significant mri uh, driven functional parameters of noted so just to conclude uh, myocardial glucose fatty metabolism was uh, was discussed and again as i mentioned 
uh, insulin resistance was the main issue there and tight glycemia was alone does not increase the mortality uh, decrease the mortality i should say uh, all other parameters should be uh, treated well like hypertension lipids and other things and sp sglt2 had uh, uh, decreased the heart failure no question about it but the interplay between the heart and the kidney is too complex and it's not well understood this is the conclusion from the esd group uh, i conclude by saying uh, cvd is a major cardiac uh, cause of death and disability among the people with diabetic no question about it and uh, cvd in patients with type 2 reduce the life expectancy almost like 10 years purely because of uh, cvd and uh, cardiovascular clock starts even uh, before the diagnosis of diabetes we know that and then the guidelines recommend to assess cv risk in patients with diabetes before designing management plan a newer ad a new oads and basal insulin uh, with origin trial and stuff uh, may help in addressing the cv risk in patients with type 2 i stop there uh, in view of time um, and i'm happy to take questions at the end thank you So thank you, Dr. Suresh. That was very good. And uh, I think you've finished right within the time. And uh, now we are moving on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sachin Chitpur, uh, who will be speaking on the uh, kidney uh, in this triangle. And Dr. Sachin Chitpur is an endocrinologist practicing in Bhopal. He has completed his MBBS and MD from GMC Bhopal and his DM from Ames, New Delhi. And apart from his endocrinological practice, Dr. Chitwat also teaches undergraduate and postgraduate students as an associate professor of medicine at Gandhi Medical College at Hamdiya Ma Hospital, Bhopal. He has award to his name, a Rising Star Award from ITC Mayo Clinics in Mumbai 2017, AV Gandhi Award for paper writing in 2012, and many. And his special interest is in Cushing syndrome, metabolic bone disorders, and reproductive endocrinology. He's a guest faculty in many national and international conferences since 2012. So uh, uh, I welcome Dr. Sachin Titwa to uh, give his presentation on kidney in this triangle of liver, heart, and kidney. Dr. Sachin Titwa. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson, for kind introduction. And... Uh, I will, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Bansi for giving me this opportunity and the team DICON. And uh, they have really put forward the way they have actually did for the Defeat Diabetes Program. Now, we are ushering into the new academic world where we are talking about new aspects of this. Uh, I think I'm well audible. Yeah. Yeah. So... Today, I've been given the task to talk about kidney as a key target organ for cardiorenal metabolic risk reduction. As we all know, uh, there was a point of time when we used to talk about kidney and we used to talk about diabetes and its bad effects on kidneys. And uh, kidney used to be the sufferer. But uh, as a time grew, when we got newer molecules, definitely like GLP analogs and SGL2 inhibitors, the scenario with respect to our thought process where we used to think kidney as a sufferer, it became a target organ for bringing out the real benefits which we did not knew before. So there are so many things which have actually changed. Uh, I will like to cover a little bit uh, about the kidney disease. Again, as you all know, is a leading cause for end-stage kidney disease in India. And uh, diabetic kidney disease, again, has a major share of around 60% and rest, the rest of the diseases are there. So the morbidity is high when we are talking about kidney disease in India and uh, especially in context to diabetes. So basically this progression of micro to macro albuminuria and overt albuminuria and end stage renal disease is something we knew since long but there were issues we did not have molecules to look after that and that was that has i think was somehow somewhere was restricting us uh, to reap up the benefits of kidney as an organ to help us with respect to cardiovascular outcome the metabolic outcome and other things so 
Diabetes amplifies the uh, chronic kidney disease and CVD paradigm and the greater risk of CVD, morbidity, premature mortality. These are the issues we have. And UK videos also showed once microalbumin urea develops, death rates outpace CKD progression by 2 is to 1. So higher severus, presence of CKD and vascular dysfunction actually meant kidney disease and diabetes. So the number of people receiving the renal replacement therapy is projected to double and this is what we have projections for Asia and that is phenomenally high. So the risk topic becomes very relevant and pertinent with context to our population. So it shortens the lifespan by 16 years and we all know in our clinical practice we have seen patients who are as chronic kidney disease and these are the diabetic patients where we need to intervene. So the only proven treatment was some few six years back, five, six years back was definitely, uh, we used to give ACE inhibitors, we used to give ARBs, we used to give, we used to control blood pressure and uh, definitely little bit of reduction of this albumin urea. We used to think as if we are catering the disease and we are addressing the disease properly. So the whole scenario of this uh, cardiovascular renal benefits and diabetes actually came into picture after this trial for kenagliflozin, that is the credence. I will say this is one of the legendary trials we had and followed by now we know the trials like DAPA-CKD and there's also a trial on empagliflozin, which is again pointing out kidney as a target organ to prevent lot many things. So how does it is really working? Basically in diabetic kidney disease, it is the RPF and estimated GFR, which is at fault, an increase in GFR basically leads to increase in filtration and there is proximal tubular hypertrophy and this proximal tubular hypertrophy is because of this SGLT2 role is there and this leads to increase in hypoxia inducing factors, which is actually causing decrease in erythropoietin levels and decrease in oxygenation. There is a kind of oxidative stress which leads to hypoxia, less of peritubular capillaries. Again, there are so many things which are in interplay. And uh, now a little bit deviating from the topic, when you are talking about kidney, the benefits of kidney with respect to its role in diabetes and cardiovascular outcome, no molecule other than SGLT2 inhibitor comes into play. So, uh, this is how it works. It decreases the angiotensin, decreases the growth factors. It is again helping with respect to erythropoiesis. So I'll be talking about the beneficial role, how this kidney is helping us with respect to good outcome when it comes to a patient of type 2 diabetes. So there are so many trials and uh, showing meaningful kidney benefits regardless of type 2 diabetes status like this emperor trial. DAPA CKD trial, as I was talking about the credence trial. So it has been proved every now and then, and SGL2 inhibition increases the erythropoiesis and may improve any. And this is again a newer thing which is happening now. So the molecule is offering us uh, because the whole story of kidney, talking about kidney in this reverse gear, started with this SGL2 inhibitor. So I'll be concentrating more on SGL2 inhibitors. So Emperor reduced, this is basically one of the trials which showed increase in seven grams per deciliter and see as compared to placebo, the response was 2.5 fold increase in odds. So the resolution of anemia again is we never knew. And this is again at the molecular level, there is a mesenchymal transition in proximal tubules. It talks about the glucose and SGLT2 inhibitors, again causing with respect to, it is uh, basically there is suppression of this SIRT3 suppression, which is actually stopped by this SGLT2 inhibitors and it helps in the mesenchymal transmission in proximal tubules. It helps in the tubule of improving the tubular functions of kidneys. So it possibly influenced, the, especially with respect to sympathetic nervous system also, that is, we never thought of this. And there is a renal hemodynamic effect, reduce renal stress, improve renal function. 
So this particular molecule as an entity is now indirectly explaining us how the kidney is affecting brain, how the kidney is affecting heart and how to come up with these kind of problems. And for the first time now we have data which is pointing out the benefits and in the, in the knowledge of the, basically the present scenario, it's becoming very obvious that kidneys, they do help with respect to the metabolic outcome. So even this has led to the change in guidelines regarding the hypertension also. And, uh, and these are basically from the nephro people. And this, there is role of diabetes, control of diabetes, an anti-diabetic drug, which is helping with respect to excess of sympathetic activation, refractory hypertension, and all those things. So it improves outcome in patients with type 2 diabetes, consistent kidney benefits across baseline albuminuria values, and the kidney outcomes by basically see there is 32 percent reduction in the risk for kidney events. And uh, so indirectly, it is helping our patients. So this is a real world data where they have compared it with a DP4 inhibitor. And uh, this shows the serious kidney events are down when you go for amphagliflozin. This was one of the SGL2 inhibitors used in this trial. And see the 58% lowering risk of serious kidney events. And uh, apart from that, lowering of the kidney serious events, again, we all know 65% of our diabetics who have kidney disease, they die because of heart disease. So indirectly lowering the kidney events, somehow, somewhere, we are helping our patients with respect to good cardiovascular and metabolic outcome when it comes to the treatment of diabetes. So the treatment algorithm for selecting uh, anti hyperglycemic drugs for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, uh, see about this, uh, is talking about the physical activity, nutrition, weight loss, metformin, SGL2 inhibitors. Basically, every, in the last two, three years, uh, there is a gross changes have come in in the field of the sequential initiation of the drug. And now we are talking about kidney more and there is a special segment in the drug armamentarium where it's talk about, it talks about the SGLT2, early initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors because they are the drug who are helping us with respect to good kidney outcome when it comes to diabetes management. So the patient phenotype also plays role with the clinical decision tool. And that is how the people are using it nowadays. And uh, there are a little bit uh, places where we should avoid, and that has to be uh, taken care of by the physician who is looking after. So the ADA standard guidelines I was talking about, this is just where this particular field where they have actually, this particular group of drugs have come in. And uh, especially I will like to concentrate where the progression of diabetic kidney disease and the beneficial role of glyphosins and this is what the new, which has been added in the last two, three years. So dear friends, the uh, kidney was a sufferer. Now, again, indirectly, we are now using kidney to improve the metabolic outcomes. And it is indirectly helping us with respect to the cardiovascular outcome also. And we have seen this in the credence data also. Uh, they could not establish the superior, there was a fight going on in between these molecules to show uh, which molecule reduces the cardiovascular death. And uh, it was there for the first molecule I will like, not like to name, but later on, they could establish it in kidney disease, especially for the rest of the two molecules also, when they combined it with uh, the end stage renal disease and one, for one of the molecule, it showed uh, prevention of cardiovascular death. And for the other molecule, when they, the, when they pulled the data for hospitalization for heart failure, they could show prevention, the treating with the diabetes and kidney disease, and definitely has its role in prevention of cardiovascular death. So dear friends, with this, I will end my talk uh, by saying kidney is not just sufferer. Now kidney is a target point for curing so many or answering so many queries related to cardiovascular outcome and the metabolic benefits in type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Thanks a lot for giving this opportunity.